Bulbinaka and uh, good afternoon. We have received confirmation from the Microbiological Diagnostic Unit at the Peter Doherty Institute in Melbourne that uh, recent cases of uh, COVID-19 are of the B1617 variant that was first detected in India. As mentioned yesterday, our contact tracing investigations meant that uh, we already strongly suspected that this was the variant in question. As case 73, the soldier working in the border quarantine only had contact with uh, recent uh, border quarantine cases who had traveled from India. This has, informed our con this has informed our containment measures and we have already adapted them accordingly. But I want the public to have a clear grasp of the stakes here. Because the discipline and diligence of ordinary Fijians will make or break our containment of this viral variant. This newly confirmed COVID variant is one of several dangerous new variants that have taken root in places like Brazil, South Africa, the United Kingdom, United States, and in India, which is suffering a painful fourth wave, the likes of which the world has never seen. So we recognize exactly what we are up against. I want to take a minute to read the media media's account of B1617 variant's devastation, for example, in India, as reported by BBC. India is now in the grips of a public health emergency. Social media feeds are full with videos of COVID funerals at crowded cemeteries. Wailing relatives of the dead outside hospitals, long queues of ambulances carrying gasping patients, mortuaries overflowing with the dead, and patients, sometimes two in a bed, in corridors and lobbies of the hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot let that nightmare happen in Fiji. And we still have time to stop it from happening. But a single misstep will bring about the same COVID tsunami that our friends in India, Brazil, South Africa, the United Kingdom, and United States are enduring. Now, stopping the tsunami depends on two major factors. Your job, your job is to stay home. Our job is tracing and isolation of all the known cases. So that means we screen, we trace, and we isolate. I can stand here every day and update you only on what we are doing. Screen, detect, isolate. That's all I can do over here. The rest is up to you. I cannot make myself any more clearer than that. The Ministry of Health's responsibility is to screen, trace and isolate. End of story. The rest is up to the people of Fiji. While the results from Melbourne confirmed a frightening new variant, they also confirmed that we were on the right track in terms of our containment efforts. The genetic sequencing revealed that all of the sample sequence so far have the same virus variant. This confirms our investigations that case 73, the border quarantine uh, soldier, case 74, the hotel worker who attended the Tavakumbu funeral, and the woman from uh, Wainitarau in Cunningham are all within the same cluster. It also reveals that two of the recently announced border quarantine cases from the same border quarantine facility, soldiers who had returned recently from overseas duties, also have the same variant. This indicates transmission within that 
border quarantine facility. Since yesterday's news conference, we've detected six more new cases of COVID-19 in Fiji. All six cases were detected among Fijians who are currently in quarantine. Four of the six new cases came from soldiers recently returning from overseas duties, some of who had been fraternizing amongst each other during their 14-day quarantine in the border quarantine facility against the rules that we had set in place. Their quarantine period have already been extended due to suspected breaches. And unfortunately, these bad apples mean that we have to reset the clock again for all the soldiers within that unit. Heroes who have been recent, who have been separated far too long from their families. Each of these new patients tested neg negative multiple times before this latest diagnosis. This gives us a great level of confidence that they contracted the virus while in quarantine. Very recently from one of their colleagues. That is unacceptable. No unnecessary frivolous contact is worth an extra two weeks in quarantine. And that's precisely what all of those internal hotels will now need to endure under much stricter watch as we reset the, watch, the clock. Thank God we did so after learning that an earlier case had mingled among his companions. Otherwise, we would have had more cases, more clusters, as COVID-positive soldiers returned to their families. Out of an abundance of caution, we will also be recalling all individuals discharged from Tano Hotel from the 12th of April 2021 to be screened, swabbed, and tested. In addition to this cluster of soldiers, two, sold, uh, two cases were confirmed among the family members of the lady from Waini Tarawao in Cunningham. Cases that, because of the highly transmissible nature of this likely vi variant, we had already expected. These family members had been admitted in the Lavo isolation unit since Wednesday, April 21st. They tested negative in their first two tests in quarantine, and they now test positive after five days in quarantine. They are not considered a transmission risk to the public. Our six new COVID-19 cases, all of whom are safely confined within quarantine or isolation units, bring Fiji's total of 109 confirmed cases since our first case was detected on March 19, 2020. We now have 42 confirmed active cases in isolation. I say confirmed because I've stressed before the number of actual undetected cases is likely to be higher. And that's precisely why, for your health, and the health of your loved ones, you should be wearing a mask at all times. You must download Care Fiji and keep it switched on whenever you're out of your home. When you initially download the Care Fiji, we will top up the data. When it is running, it uses minimal battery and does not chew your data. If you one of more than 600,000 Fijians with a smartphone, there is no excuse not to have it downloaded. The family from Makoi did not have the app downloaded or running. That has made our contact tracing far more complex than expected, than we ought to have been. Lives are now at risk as a result. I also want to address some comments about the contact tracing stemming from the husband and the wife living in Makoi. When the wife first tested positive, we announced her case, announced her as a case on Sunday, April 25th. We initially feared a case of community transmission. We knew at the time that her husband was a soldier that worked in the quarantine facility, but we were missing some critical information. Firstly, we did not know yet we did not yet have information on when he last returned home and 
we needed to have him tested. He was tested later on Sunday with his results available in the early hours of Monday morning. When his positive result, with his positive result, we could now then make the link back to a border quarantine facility. And later on Monday morning, we also confirmed that he had close contact with K73, the first soldier who tested positive in the border quarantine facility. After he had tested negative on April the 10th and before returning home on April the 12th. We knew then that he and his wife were connected to the same chain of transmission extending from the initial sol uh, soldier working in the border quarantine facility. Once we confirmed this link, we announced it yesterday, Monday, April 26th. That's the timeline. And I hope it's clear for everyone. We will continue to be transparent about what we know when we know it. However, we cannot release information that does not have a sound evidence base and is not verified. Even if it might alleviate some public anxiety, unverified information will not come out of our mouths. Instead, we will communicate medically verifiable information. Because I know the Fijian people will expect nothing less. I would like to say that the effectiveness of our contact tracing depends on what we are told by positive cases during our interviews with them. And the information that we get from the public when we make an appeal. If, any, if someone forgets that they had contact with a person, it will be very difficult for us to find them. Which is why, again, we ask everyone to download the Care Fiji app. It will help us find contacts when the patient is not able to tell us about all their contacts. We continue to trace, isolate, and test those who have been in contact with our current patients, a push that depends heavily on self-identification. While most of Fiji is safely at home, my teams are taking full advantage of the containment window. More than 93 Fijians in Cunningham, Lotoka, Nandi, Wainivula, Daumbati, Tadirua, and Makoi have been checked for COVID-like symptoms and travel histories that may place them in the path of Fijians living with COVID-19. We have more than 120,000 Fijians left to screen in these areas. And we need as many Fijians at home as possible to do that job well. Our contact tracing is designed to flush out cases before they become clusters. The strategy has served us well before, but it is not infallible. Currently, we are relying on the history, so it's not infallible. There are gaps, particularly, especially when it comes to identifying passengers on public transportation. Any one of these gaps become the source of an outbreak. Again, Cafe G app can close these gaps but only if you have it installed and you keep it on. House-to-house -house screening as well may reveal some of those outbreaks in waiting. But to screen thoroughly, we must take this effort on as a society. There are more than 40 screening clinics open throughout Fiji. Every Fijian should know which clinic is closest to them. If you feel unwell, go get screened. If you know someone who's unwell, take them to be screened and get yourself screened. Otherwise, you stay home, call 158 so the team can come and check on you. The full list of screening clinics is on the Fijian government Facebook page. If we follow this advice, I promise you, these clinics will save more lives. In fact, I can promise you now that these clinics, wherever they are right now, Tomorrow, they should be able to start picking up more cases that are sitting around in the community that we do not know yet. My team is fielding a number of requests from businesses and organizations seeking exemptions from our containment measures. We know how tough of a time this is for many businesses, but we have been clear, and we will continue to be clear. 
that we at the ministry are in the business of stopping out the virus and saving lives. Our restrictions are designed for that purpose. Now, not every policy will make everybody happy. The spirit behind them is perfectly clear. We have to keep Fiji safe. We have to limit movement. We have to stop every unnecessary person-to-person -person interaction as possible. I digress a bit to say one more thing. The virus can only live if you keep passing it. It can only exist if it keeps moving from one person to another. Otherwise, if you don't pass it, it dies. That's how the virus works. My message to every Fijian is this. Now is not the time to go looking for loopholes. If we don't win this fight over the next two weeks and this outbreak gets out of control, the prospect of job, micro, small and medium enterprises, entire industries and our economy as a whole will fall into more and more dire straits. I've explained at great length how this virus travels. It can travel through the air, through tiny droplets that pass from person to person within a close distance. Drops, droplets that, if left unmasked and non-distant, are proven killers. Just because our officials may not be looking does not mean that the virus cannot travel to you. Protecting yourself and your family means denying this virus any opportunity to spread. Any person-to-person -person contact outside your household could get you infected. Don't take the chance. Most importantly, you should stay at home. It's the easiest and most foolproof way you can, spread, you can slow the spread. Stay home. Save the country from a deadly wave of uh, infection. If you see a breach of our measures happening, I'm asking you to take it personally. Because it could very well be you or someone in your family who will suffer from the irresponsibility of others. Call the police or call 158. Report it. It's your duty as a Fijian to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Um, so I will give my usual sum up of the cases as well as our testing. So as announced by the Permanent Secretary for Health and Medical Services today, we have, we have um, six new cases of uh, COVID-19. And these six cases were detected amongst Fijians who are currently in quarantine or isolation facilities. Four of the new cases come from soldiers completing 14 days in a government um, supervised border quarantine facility after recently returning from overseas duties. And the remaining two are family members of the lady from Cunningham. And they tested positive while in the isolation facility. And this is the five days into uh, their stay in the isolation facility. Because of that, they're not considered a transmission risk to the public. So with these latest cases, there are now 42 active cases in isolation. Five are older border quarantine uh, cases announced before Sunday, April 18th. 13 are recently announced border quarantine cases, and the 24 are locally transmitted cases. So in total, Fiji has had 109 cases since our first case was announced on March the 19th of uh, 2020. We've had 65 recoveries and two deaths. A total of 48,677 tests uh, have been conducted for COVID-19. And out of that, we've done um, about 777 tests per day in the last seven days on average. Daily testing, of course, has increased in line with our response to these recent cases. And uh, yesterday, we conducted over 500 tests. Our test positivity overall is 0.2%, and our um, Seven-day average has been 0.7 percent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Fang. Uh, I'm Christiana, all the way from FBC News. Um, as you've noted, military disobedience is now imposing risk to the whole country. What uh, different approach is the ministry going to take to ensure that uh, 
uh, this uh, recent incident uh, that can that could have been avoided uh, will not repeat itself in in the in the future and also what are the collaboration and consultations is the ministry carrying out with uh, with our members of the force to ensure that they are aware of how dangerous um, uh, this uh, pandemic really is yes uh, we they uh, I mean most of the measures that we have taken as I said we have come down very firmly on that group eh? uh, the, there's a group that are currently in and we're keeping them in um, there is uh, an ongoing investigation and right now as I speak a response is happening within the military okay um, I just do not want to have to discuss it at this moment because I want it to be part of my discussion tomorrow after the response is complete and then I uh, mention it eh? I do want to assure the public plenty times when I'm telling you what we have done that's after we have done it completely and we know that it's firmed up then we announce it it's not like we are announcing it and then we are going to implement it okay the reason is because uh, as I mentioned before whenever we do a containment measure uh, sometimes it's not good to have to say it first and then go and do it sometimes it's better to do it first and then come and announce it eh? for obvious reasons yes. Dr. Fong Eva from Legend FM and Fiji Village News just uh, back to uh, the case uh, 73 on the day he was tested positive was the McCoy soldier one of the one of the people that was uh, one of the main uh, people that was um, contact traced by the ministry? Okay, from on, uh, I, I go back again to this narrative and I need it very clear because I think there's a lot of people who are confused out there. He tested, K73 was negative in a test on the 10th <coughs> of April. Set. Soon after that, he came in contact with the passengers. The next time he was due for testing was on the 17th of April. Eh? Okay. He had a roommate who also tested negative. That roommate was a close contact, so we kept him in the tunnel. He never came out at all. He never came out. The husband of the McCoy lady was looking after Novotel. He also tested negative on the 10th. And you know when you swab beyond the 10th, then you wait again for the results. And then when it finally comes on the 12th, he's there good to go. Okay. They came down to pick up the people that were in Tanoa who were set to discharge. Based again on the fact that they were all negative on April the 10th. That's the swab on April 10th. When he came down on the April 12th to pick up those groups, he came outside and they interacted again with case number 73. Now remember, K73 became positive on 17th. So on 12th, he was still considered a negative person. Okay? Now we come back again to when did we know about that soldier? The reason we only know about that soldier is because we diagnosed the wife, then we link the wife to that soldier, then we link that soldier to that contact. And this is why I'm trying to tell you today, the contact tracing is only as good as the history I got because no cap Fiji care app is up, uh, up, uh, up and now on. If the app was on, if that fella had the app on, the soldier had the app on, and he had the app on, I would have picked him up long ago. Sorry, I get a bit. You can understand why I get angry about this. Eh? We've been saying this on and on for a long time. When the going was good, put on the app. Download the app when the going was good. Now we wait until the going gets bad. And then we're all running around trying to blame us for the contact tracing. What part do you supposed to play? 
You supposed to play your part. Download the app. You supposed to play your part. Do your social distancing. Wear your mask. Clean your hands. So, that's the story. Eh? That, uh, I mean, I apologize a little bit for, not much, I don't apologize much. I apologize a little bit for being a bit passionate. But it's just, you know, if you're in my place and you understand that I've been saying this on and on for ages and nobody wants to follow and after that people criticize you in the media for saying these kind of things, then after a while, people get angry. Me too, I can get angry. Uh, Dr. Fong, looking away from the Fiji Times, uh, now that we have um, identified the variant and that it was first detected in India, um, are we, uh, uh, and just because the country is still getting in flights from India, are we going to change uh, that cause or? We're not having any more flights coming in. Oh. We've already cancelled. There's only some flights going out, yes, but no flights coming in. If there's a flight coming in, it'll have to be a private chartered flight that we understand where it comes from. Tale from the Fiji Sun. Uh, you've stressed uh, a lot about the Care Fiji app and how people, the importance of it, how people need to download. Um, is that something you're considering making compulsory in the near future for people to download and install the Care Fiji app? You know my reply to anything when you people ask me if we can make it compulsory. I'm still stuck with this problem. Why do I need to make this thing compulsory? Is it that, I mean, I'm sure the Fijian IQ is higher enough to understand that there is a big problem we got out there. Why do I need to make it compulsory? There is absolutely no need for it to be compulsory. We just know that we're going to be in danger. We react in a constructive manner. We download the app, we keep our social distancing, and all the other COVID safe measures. I'd just like to add that um, we have seen a big increase in the amount of people that are downloading the app recently. Um, so as of today, we, there's over 200,000 um, downloads of the app. I think it's about 213,000. This is a massive increase of about 100,000 since uh, I think a week ago. So this local localized transmission, this outbreak has really pushed people um, to download the app and people see the importance. We wish that it didn't have to take an outbreak for this to happen, but we are encouraged by this and we ask everybody else who has a smartphone and doesn't have the app download, please do download the app. Thank you. Dr. Fong, uh, Mary Oni from Fiji One. There is a social media post uh, on Facebook about a suspected COVID-19 case in Rotuma that has caused the fear in, in the community. Can you please confirm or deny this? Uh? I, we're not aware. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, every information that comes from my mouth has to be based on a swab that is tested at Fiji CDC. <coughs> There's only one swab, one Fiji CDC in Fiji. There's not plenty Fiji CDC in Fiji. So we only know that that's the only source. They tell me, then I take to you. It, we haven't received uh, such a result. Uh, I'd like to add also, I think there was a bit of confusion yesterday. We had asked um, anybody who's left Viti Levu and gone to any of the outer islands, including Vanua Levu, to please uh, call into your, your healthcare provider, your health health center. The reason we did this is out of an abundance of caution. There's no additional information that we're not telling you about for this. Our, our health teams actually in those places, in Vanolevu, in Tavuni, in the Outer Islands, have asked us if we could put that message out because, just in case, they want to prevent any spread um, to their area. They're just being proactive. They're doing screening, um, a lot of screening in Vanolevu, in Tavuni, because um, I think sometimes we, we say to them that, you know, they might be stigmatizing the level a bit. But really, it's because the healthcare workers in those areas just want to make sure that they're covering all the bases. They can see their colleagues in Vitilevu 
really doing these mass screenings and they want to get on the front foot and do that there as well. So it's not because we have any new information about spread out to those places. It's out of an abundance of caution. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dr. Fong, Eva Mera from the Fiji Sun. Um, I have a question, sir. Um, you mentioned yesterday that we have uh, 80 ventilators, 40 are being used and 40 are on standby. And uh, today you've mentioned that the new variant has been identified as the one similar to that in India that's uh, taken a toll on the country. Um, I'm guessing a lot of people would be very, very curious as to the capacity that the ministry has in addressing should there be an outbreak like this in Fiji. Naka. Yeah, uh, we have reserve capacity, as I mentioned, and the example I gave was the fact that we had ventilators that are in reserve waiting to be used. We are creating bed space in reserve waiting to be used. And of course, we are all hoping and praying that it doesn't get used. I'm hoping and praying that there are more Fijians who will start now protecting their elderly family members, those who got comorbidities, pulling them away, telling them don't go anywhere. Right. But at the same time, they will also be careful. If they go somewhere, they come back home, they won't bring it to them. Because if I can keep the vulnerable protected, then we might not have to use too much of that reserve, uh, me medical reserve that we're talking about. Eh? Then now, we are, all, we are actually very much hoping that whatever reserve we got, all that extra ventilator, we're hoping that it doesn't get used. Eh? And the only way we can stop it from being used is by making sure that we now take the action of trying to protect as much as possible all those with diabetes, all those, our elderly uh, family, including my mom and dad, who I have to stay in their house. Nobody is allowed to go inside now. They stay by themselves. We're protecting them. Because I do know that those are the group that will overwhelm. Once we have a lot of sick people in hospitals, then the viral load around the environment will start to increase progressively. Then the, as the disease gets more common, then the younger people will start getting sick and will keep on going down the road. Okay. I'm just going to add to that. Um, we have this question about ventilators a lot. I'd like to point out a ventilator is one machine. It needs humans to operate it. It needs specialist doctors, specialist nurses. And you can't just grow them overnight. You can't even grow them in a year. There is no country in the world that is prepared for a massive outbreak of COVID-19 that's uncontrolled, that has gone beyond the public health and social measures that we're doing right now. What we're doing right now, why you see so many of our healthcare workers out in the divisions doing screening, we have people from the hospitals who normally work in the hospitals. We have oral health um, people, dentists out there doing screening because we know we need to stop it out there. We need these public health and social measures to work. Otherwise, as Dr. Fong mentioned yesterday, if we start getting cases appearing at the hospitals, people coming in, into intensive care units, those same screeners out there, the, ho the hospital workers, they will have to come back to the hospital. And it means that we are standing down and almost giving up on those preventative measures. And we're just trying to save lives by that point. It's happened in so many countries around the world. <coughs> this is why we are asking you, please stay home. Wash your hands with soap and water. Wear a mask. This is so serious, this, this time is critical for us. Because just like all other countries who can't cope with those outbreaks, once it hits their hospitals, it's similar here. Again, ventilators, steel machines, please think of the big picture. Thank you. Dr. Fong, the Gazette is clear. It uh, clearly states that people need to remain within their containment area and must only leave the containment area once the uh, authorization comes from the Permanent Secretary of Health, which is you, sir. We have witnessed movement around the containment areas and um, from one containment area to another. And uh, we have also seen a lot of drivers and people who have passes. 
your comments on that, sir. I know you highlighted on Sunday that the virus needs to be contained within one containment area if it's um, if cases are in one particular containment area just your comments on this sir you you know this is one of the reasons why i always struggle when everybody wants to make something mandatory because now that we've made it mandatory now that we've got a, a pass going out you no know, everybody finds a way of finding a pass now the focus for everybody is how do I get a pass? How do I get a pass? They forget the spirit of what we're trying to do. They forget the fact that we are trying to prevent the movement of a virus. See? This morning I was asked, oh, how do I get uh, certain human beings from one place across the containment zone to another place? Why don't you start writing a checkbox of things that I, I need to fulfill before I can get a pass? I said, if I give one checkbox, all that will happen is that everybody will try to find a loophole to try and fit the checkbox. Recently, we talked about some uh, industries that we said you'll have to close because you're non-essential. But because if you are doing, uh, if you're manufacturing some medical equipment, we will give you some dispensation to move around. Suddenly, we got hardware shops producing masks. Where did they get the machine from? Now we got how many other manufacturers producing hand sanitizers? Where did that come from? So you see what I'm getting at? This is the problem when we try to make everything mandatory and you, everybody say, oh no, you have to write it in the law. When you write it in the law, we forget the spirit of what we're trying to do. We forget the medical agenda, we all try to bypass the law some way or the other. Okay. And this is the, it's, it's a difficult space that I work in. It's not a space that can be legislated. It's a space that requires that we upset the amount of common sense. What I need is good sense has to become common sense. And at the moment, my own feeling is that there is not enough good sense in the common sense space. And so now that the health ministry has established the uh, variant of this uh, this virus in this current outbreak and the recent cases had a large contact uh, community contact base that uh, the images yet to identify uh, all identify and uh, people are still breaching COVID-19 uh, protocols that are set up by the ministry can you please clarify why uh, a total lockdown is still not a necessary at this stage The lockdown we have now is actually the conditions for this lockdown is more strict than the one previously. Um, we can ask for total lockdown, yes. There is another small part to this equation. If I lock you down and you have no access to food and you can't eat, what will happen? You'll get angry, you'll say, I don't care about this virus and you will leave your home, and you will break the law, then you will end up with too many people in jail, and we're back again to square one. You get me? Any lockdown that we do, there has to be a balance. I want to stop the virus, but you have to eat. At least you need to have access to something that's essential, something that's, I need people to move around to get in medical emergency. So it's because we have to nuance access to essential items with stopping the transmission of the virus, that you can't just force a total lockdown. Of course, unless you anticipated the lockdown and you stocked up your house with huge amounts of food, then only you will eat, but the rest of Fiji will not eat. And so in, uh, initially, during the initial stages of this recent outbreak, you mentioned that the ministry has a testing capacity of conducting 600 tests per day, but uh, in the last seven days, you've uh, noted a 738 tests on an average on a daily basis. How much longer can the ministry go before um, you find uh, that uh, you find a challenge in the gene expert testing kits that you currently have at the pace that we are going? Yes, as you mentioned, so we had estimated that our maximum um, daily capacity was about 600 tests. Before that, we were testing at a rate about 250 to 300 tests a day on average, and that was already um, beyond the uh, WHO uh, standard of, I think it was two per thousand um, per week. So because of this outbreak, we said, okay, we can go to six 
600 tests per day. To our surprise, because of the dedicated staff that we have in our in Fiji CDC, as well as the other labs around the country. So we're also doing testing at Lambasa Hospital, at Lotoko Hospital, uh, some at CWM, also at Tumi, which normally just does uh, TB testing. All of these labs have come together and actually increased the capacity well above what we thought. Um, some days we test over a thousand samples and that's with existing supplies. Now thanks to our um, partnerships with um, organizations like the World Health Organization, UNICEF, SBC, we're able to ask, tell them that we are increasing our testing capacity, please help. So we are getting a lot of support from them to make sure we have this um, incoming consumables coming in for lab testing. And it's not just gene expert testing as you mentioned, we're also doing the RT-PCR at Fiji CDC, so that's a completely, it's a different uh, test again, a different platform that requires different consumables again. But yes, we've anticipated this big surge and we're anticipating that we're going to test more than a thousand per day and thankfully our partners um, have come up. Uh, the Australian government of course ha has been very helpful as well as the New Zealand government and both, uh, they've all stepped up and have given them, given us all the support um, that we need. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fong, you had mentioned that uh, we have uh, 42 confirmed active cases. Uh, uh, that's uh, currently what we have. Uh, and uh, you had uh, Dr. Lisha had also mentioned that uh, we had to bring in uh, oral health workers, and it, it's kind of a whole of a Ministry of Health effort to go out and screen people. It, it's quite evident, sir, because of the increasing number of cases and also the increasing number that has to be contact traced. So just for the record, are you, be, are you able to, to confirm if uh, this is uh, the highest number of active cases we have recorded? And also, uh, like I've said, you had had to include oral health workers or the whole of Ministry of Health approach to go out and contact uh, trace or screen those in other communities. And maybe just other ways it has impacted the Ministry of Health. Would you be able to just give us a, a confirmation if this is the highest number of active cases we have recorded and other ways that it has impacted the Ministry of Health as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I can confirm this is the highest number of active cases we've ever had. Um, think of it, uh, the first wave we had 18 cases over one month. We've had a sudden, we've multiplied that 18 in the space of a week. Um, when uh, we had the 18 cases in the first wave, we recruited a lot of uh, those same paramedical people, but we recruited them to go and do the community-wide screening. You know, the, the one that we did, like 95% of Fiji's population, we went from door to door. In this case, we are recruiting the same group, but this time it's just for targeted screening and uh, containment measures. Okay. And then after that, we are doing mass screening only in and around some of the targeted areas. Okay. Uh, at some point, I hope that after a while, when we have no more cases reported out of our measures, then I can expand that group to go and do a mass testing all over the country and uh, see if we can mop up anything else that is lying down or lying around. But at the moment, the same. Uh, the, the, that group is now working on a targeted uh, way of screening and containment. Um, how else would it affect the medi uh, medical services? Yes. We will have to start standing down some of our routine services to concentrate on this effort. It is also evident that a lot of our routine effort is too done because of the lockdown. So some people will have uh, minor ailments they will have to wait it out or seek advice over the phone to work out what they need to have done. So because a lot of our medical doctors are not as uh, busy, we've recruited them into the effort together with the paramedical people. And uh, of course, if we have to keep, if we have to, if it, we think that the strategy will save a lot more lives, then we will stand on a lot more services and move a lot more people out to do the screening. Um, Dr. Fong, uh, but the recall of uh, 
um, individuals who were housed at Tano Hotel uh, for quarantine. Uh, why is that um, the recall confined to individuals who are released uh, from Tano Hotel only for that period and not the other quarantine facilities? Uh, sorry, that's where the variant we found. We're responding to the variant. We know that it's more transmissible. And therefore, I didn't find the variant in any other place. And none of our, we didn't have any returnees going to Novotel or any of the other hotels. So I'm, I don't catch the spirit of the question. I'm not too sure why you were asking. Uh, it, why it's not confined only? Because we've had cases where individuals have been released to the community and then they, they test negative. But then they, they are, they, when they test it later, it's positive. Um, so how are you keeping a tab on, how are you keeping a tab on, on their whereabouts? Yeah. If okay. So I get where, you come, where your question is coming from. Usually, you're right. Uh, well, the reason why we concentrating on uh, Tano is because of the fact that we got a variant that's in Tano that is highly transmissible. And as demonstrated in this case, one, uh, one of the soldiers was negative, considered negative, fit to go home. He just contacted somebody briefly after he tested negative and he got to you. We've also noticed that uh, some of the contact times that we had between uh, the uh, case 73 and others are fairly short. So it's for that reason that we are focusing mostly on Tanwa. The other hotels have not had uh, cases that originate from India. They have had, uh, we have had one where a family where the case originated from, uh, from uh, Philippines, but that one has been nicely contained. We have not seen any evidence of anything else happening in that area. Every time we have a <coughs> positive case in one facility, we ramp up the swabbing of the people in the facility so that we can keep uh, we did that too every time we saw the, that facility that had those people from philippines we swapped everybody they all turned out negative in this case from Tano, what we worried about is the false negative yeah because if that uh, virus is highly infectious it's possible that we might have some false negatives coming out so that's why we out of you know out of caution we have to go back and check it again okay Yeah, I think uh, I should also mention that uh, I did mention in my speech, in my talk, eh, that there were a number of breaches that we have noticed in uh, Tanoa, and that the soldiers are now having to stay longer. In fact, they were supposed to go home some time ago. I extended it to seven by seven days, and now we're extending it by 14 days again. It's because there is uh, the, our Quarantine works when there's no, no, not too much mingling between the bubbles. Eh? <coughs> the bubbles, they all have to be all separate. As soon as the bubbles start to mingle, there's a higher chance of a false negative. Okay? And uh, that's, what, that's what has uh, made Tanwa an area of interest. But please, when you report it, just make sure you, everybody knows that uh, Tanwa is not the area of stigmatization. It's just an area. The virus is the problem, not the area. That's what I want uh, everybody to be clear about. It eh? doesn't mean you go and swear at Tano because Tano doesn't uh, reply. Sorry, uh, Dr. Fong, I take you back to case 73. I understand those who came into contact uh, with case 73 had actually gone under quarantine, except for the McCoy soldier. Um, how come you missed out uh, that information regarding the McCoy soldier? Did he not come into interaction with the K-73? Or was K-73 not forthcoming with uh, the information uh, gathered from him? Yeah, I mean, you know, it would have been easy if both of them had the KFG app and it was on it. I would have known it. Eh? As soon as we diagnosed K-73, we would have gone and looked around for him. We would have looked around for the, for the soldier and then we would have got to the family. We would have stopped the family from moving around and we would have prevented all this uh, running around that we're doing out in uh, Makoi. It's just unfortunate that, you know, when we develop an app and we ask that people put it on, so much of the population did not have it on. 
It's even worse when some, some portion of the population decide that the app was the sign of the devil. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Fong, yesterday you mentioned that you will uh, reveal the travel hi uh, history of the Makoi family. And also, can you please explain the the presence of uh, military and health officials at in Nandera? We, I don't know. That's part of the program that we have for screening. That we, you know, that when we go screening, we we have military and health officials doing the screening. Eh? It's not the, just the doctors who do the screening. Or am I? I'm not too sure why, why you asking that question again. So just a clarification from the public: uh, Why were health officials there? Is Nandera a uh, place that, that is uh, at risk? Uh, yesterday I mentioned that we had a small place in Makoi. Then I mentioned that we got a zone that is about that involves thirty one thousand people. I just I'm not sure as to where to what, but I presume that it's within that zone. And we will have everybody in that zone is screened. I presume that's where it's coming from. So as for the travel history of the Makoi family? Oh right. Yes. After much thought I've decided that uh the travel history, I will only glean out from travel histories areas of interest to which I want people who attended to come forth. The reason I've, I've, I mentioned a little bit in here, the reason I'm doing that is because, number one, when I give too much detail of the travel history, everybody starts to stigmatize the travel history and they forget what they're supposed to do. My message gets lost. So I feel that it is more important for me to keep highlighting the areas or the events of interest which people have attended for which I want them to come forward for, for screening. And I, I, I'm going to maintain that from now on. Yeah? One last question. Um, Dr. Fong, about the new variant. Um, how effective is the um, AstraZeneca vaccine against the new variant? There have been concerns raised. There have been concerns raised. I will tell you, I keep on saying something that people tend to forget. Every vaccine prevents you from hospitalization and severe disease death. See? The problem that we always have or the place where there's variation is in the word efficacy. Because efficacy is talking about your ability, it includes your ability to get the virus and have mild disease or asymptomatic disease. Okay. As far as I can work out, the vaccine does seem to have less, or the, uh, the variant has been suggested that it has, uh, that the vaccine has less impact on the, uh, on, the, on the variant. Okay. As far as I know, we still maintain the protection. <coughs> Get it? And as far as we the, to the best of our knowledge, we haven't got some clear cut data that says exactly how much less effective is it. So the vaccination will continue because the vaccination will save lives and the vaccination will have to be part of our response to the current surge and I will be we will be rolling out a vaccination plan that will be running concurrently with all our efforts uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll get uh, Dr. Rachel to sort that out thank you very much members of the media thank you very much Dr. Fong and Dr. Lisa